another weekend of college football is in the books. And I personally don't think that week 12 could have gone any better. Because almost all of the highly anticipated matchups lived up to the hype. And even though there were some that didn't, we had some under the radar games that actually ended up being exciting and more eventful than we could have ever hoped for and ever expected. And that, guys, is the beauty of college football. That is why college football is so great. Because every single week you take what you think you know and you throw it out the window because you just don't know. College football is so unpredictable. It keeps us on our toes from week to week. And this weekend, week 12, proved to be no different. So welcome back to the Gridiron Expert, guys. Breaking down everything that happened in week 12. We consider to be some of the best moments, some of the best games. Uh, and, and a lot of key points that we want to break down before we head into week 13. You know, the regular season is coming to an end. We are about to prepare for conference championship games. The playoff race is heating up. Bowl season is right around the corners. So we've got a lot to cover, uh, and we are here to break it down for you right now. Again, make sure to check out everything down in that description below. Timestamps are down there. It's going to be a lengthy video, so if you want to find a specific game, look in those timestamps to find which game we're talking about, and you can get there uh, a lot quicker. So let's go ahead and jump into our predictions recap here, guys. You know, these stats could have been a little bit better had we not had 18 games canceled or postponed due to COVID-19. 18, that's a record this year. I think we had about 15 last week. Now we have 18, and that included Clemson and Florida State. That game being canceled about 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, Florida State coming down and saying, yeah, you know what, we're, uh, we're concerned with the one positive case that Clemson has right now and the fact that he may have uh, you know, given it to other people, the conduct, contact uh, tracing and all that stuff. So I don't know. It sounds a little fishy to me. I feel for Clemson for preparing all week and traveling all the way to Tallahassee for that game for it to get canceled on game day as the players are going down to eat breakfast. But it is what it is. Clemson was going to win anyways. If they reschedule, Clemson will win again. Uh, regardless, though, 18 games postponed or canceled. Stats could have been a little bit better, but we're thrilled with where we're at. 22-4 and four straight up. 22-4 and four on the money line. I mean, can, can't get much better than that. Anything better would have been undefeated, in my opinion. We're looking at 84.6% on the money line on the straight up this weekend. Uh, and that is 183-53 and 53 overall on the year. You know, our goal every single year is to finish about 76%. We're at 77.5%. So if you round that up, that's 78%. We are looking at our best record this far into the season in gridiron expert history. I mean, in a year like this, I wouldn't have expected it. But again, that's the beauty of college football. Expect the unexpected. 77.5% on the year. It's only going to keep getting better against the spread. Another winning week. Another winning week. 6-3 and three against the spread. 60-51 and 51 on the year. Remember we said, we'll finish 53%. Or better, 54.1% right now. We're getting hot. We are 35 and 23 over the past six weeks. That's over 60% of our bets that we are hitting over the last six weeks. Most of those finishing with winning records. If not, it was right at 500. So we're hot against the spread, and I highly recommend you go sign up for those expert picks because not only are we going to have picks out for the remainder of this year, we're going to have it for the entire postseason. And if you sign up, it's a year-long subscription, so you get the rest of this season in all of next year as well. We're hot right now. We're making money. We're helping you make money, hopefully, if you're taking our bets. Uh, and we couldn't be thrilled with where we're at with our expert picks and our against the spread picks. Staying hot, both money line and, and against the spread, uh, again, couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier. So let's go ahead and touch into the action. Let's jump into it. I know you're tired of these numbers up here. Let's start Thursday night. A top 25 team in action. A game that wasn't supposed to be that exciting, but ended up being one of the better games of the weekend. Tulsa, 25th ranked Golden Hurricane, taking on Tulane. Now, this game was wild. I mean, wild from start to finish. Uh, Tulsa, quarterbacks going down left and right. They end up having to use their third string QB for the majority of the game. They trailed 14 to nothing to the Green Wave in this game going into the fourth quarter. And that's when Tulsa decided to turn it on. You know, you look at Tulsa this year uh, and how well they've played. They came back down, uh, what was it, 18 points? to UCF, pulled off that win. Uh, they came back here against Tulane. They pulled off that win. Came back against SMU, pulled off that win. And this game against Tulane was so wild because Tulsa scored on a 37-yard Hail Mary, Hail Mary, as time expired. Scored a touchdown as time expired to send the game to overtime. They go to double overtime. And how does Tulsa win the game? 
on a 96-yard pick six. Just like everybody would hope to end overtime. 96-yard pick six in double overtime. Tulsa survives. They're 5-1 and one on the year. They're still undefeated in American Athletic Conference play. And that means in a couple weeks when they take on Cincinnati on December 12th, you could be seeing a top 20 showdown between the Bearcats and the Golden Hurricane. One that could be their first of two meetings. They could meet that week and then meet the week after in the conference championship game. But that's going to be Cincinnati's toughest test the remainder of the year. Uh, and they're looking pretty dang good, guys. They're looking pretty dang good. So Golden Hurricane, uh, Philip Montgomery, what a job he's doing with his squad. One of the greater uh, stories, I think, in all of college football this year in Tulsa, winning a thriller on Thursday night. Going over to Saturday, let's get into the big games here. How about a top 10 showdown in the Big Ten? Number three, Ohio State. Number nine, Indiana. This game lived up to the hype. And you know, the funny thing to me, guys, is I don't think this game was getting enough hype. Yeah, it, 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 it's, you know, eye candy when you see number three and number nine, but almost everybody, everybody was writing off Indiana. They said they're 20 and a half point underdogs. Ohio State, they're going to blow them out of the water. Indiana hasn't played anybody. They beat Penn State. They beat Michigan. They beat Michigan State. They beat Rutgers. None of those guys are that good. They're going to get murdered in Columbus. And I was trying to tell you that's not going to be the case. I was trying to tell you that was not going to happen. A lot of you guys agreed. A lot of you guys predicted an even Indiana victory. And they nearly did it. This Hoosiers team shows no quit. No quit. And I love that. And I love Tom Allen's coaching style and his passion and energy that he has towards his team. Ohio State defeated Indiana 42-35, to but let's keep this in mind. Indiana trailed the Buckeyes 35-7 to early in the third quarter. Early in the third quarter, Indiana trailed by 28 points, and yet they kept chipping away. They could have rolled over and said, we're done, we're on the road, it's raining, uh, we weren't expected to win, let's just try to cover and get out of here. But they kept chipping away, chipping away. And with 10:26 remaining in the fourth quarter, 10:26 remaining in the game, Indiana only trailed 42 to 35. They were on a roll, and you can thank Michael Penix and Ty Freifogel for that. Michael Penix 491 yards and five touchdowns. His 491 yards were the fourth most passing yards allowed by Ohio State in their history. They were the most passing yards allowed by Ohio State since 1985. Keep in mind, the last time Indiana beat Ohio State was in 1988. Just a little fun fact in there. So Michael Penix lit up this Ohio State defense. Ty Freifogel, last week against Michigan State, had 200 reception yards. This week against Ohio State, the third-ranked team in the country, had 218 reception yards and three touchdowns. This Indiana defense, Indiana defense, they're ball hawks. They made Justin Fields look mortal. They made Justin Fields look average, if that. We said Justin Fields, you know, he had more total touchdowns coming into this game than he had in completions. Well, in this game, Indiana picked off Justin Fields three times, forced three interceptions off of Justin Fields. That's the most he's thrown in his career. He had thrown three interceptions in his entire career. He threw three in one game against Indiana. He threw 12 incompletions to go along with that. Only had 11 coming into this game. But yet Ohio State was still able to get the victory. Ohio State was still able to get the victory. And how did Ohio State do it? How did Ohio State do it? Obviously, building up an early lead did it. You know, that did the job. Because I guarantee you, if this game was, you know, any closer at halftime, any closer in the third quarter, I think Indiana wins. They just dug themselves in too big of a hole. But another thing that was key in this one was Ohio State's run game. The Buckeyes had 307 rushing yards on the day. Indiana, negative one. Ohio State held Indiana to negative one rushing yards. And Indiana also beat themselves. Indiana had a pick six. Michael Penix threw a pick six that extended Ohio State's lead. I believe it was back to 21 at one point in the third or fourth quarter. They don't throw that pick six. It's a seven-point game. It's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a tie game. And who knows what happens in overtime. On top of that, Indiana had that interception deep in Ohio State territory. They were trying to get a pick six of their own. And what do they do? They fumble. They get the interception. They fumble. Ohio State recovers. And instead of getting the ball inside the 20, Ohio State gets the ball back. So a roller coaster of emotions, a roller coaster of a play. If that doesn't happen, I guarantee you Indiana converts. And again, maybe we're tied and we go to overtime. 
So Indiana, they made too many mistakes. They made too many mistakes. They beat themselves up in this game. But regardless, what you do know after this is the Indiana Hoosiers are legit. If you can go into Columbus, only lose by seven, play your heart out like that, and exploit an Ohio State defense like that, you need to be taken seriously. So forget everything you were going to say about Indiana being overrated, about being overrated and about being a joke and not being nearly uh, competitive enough in the Big Ten. They're for real. Tom Allen's got this team in a position to make a very, very good bowl game and to continue to be a contender and a threat in the Big Ten for years to come. But in the end, it's the Ohio State Buckeyes that keep their playoff hopes alive, ultimately will secure the Big Ten East, uh, but they have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. No, we spent a lot of time on that game. It was one of the best of the weekend. Florida, number six, Florida, the Gators. They survived Vanderbilt 38-17. to Now, I know what you're thinking. How do you survive a team if you beat them by 21 points? Here's the thing. This is Vanderbilt we're talking about. And Florida only led the Commodores by 7 at halftime and by 14 going into the fourth quarter. Kyle Trask, yeah, he put up 383 yards and three touchdowns. He's putting up ridiculous numbers still. I might even have him as my Heisman favorite right now, although I don't think he's getting that much attention, as much as he should. But you led a Vanderbilt team by 7 at halftime, only by 14 entering the fourth quarter. Your defense allowed 319 passing yards to Ken Seals and 406 total yards to Vanderbilt. Here's the thing. If you're doing that to Vanderbilt, imagine how bad it's going to be when you face Alabama in the SEC Championship. If your defense is that bad against Vanderbilt, how bad is it going to be when you face Mac Jones, Najee Harris, and Alabama down in Atlanta? It's going to be ugly. Might be a shootout, but it's going to be ugly. So Florida, yes, they beat Vanderbilt, but the storyline on that one to me was it wasn't impressive. You won by 21. That looks better than 7. looks better than 14. But there's a lot of work to be done. So Ohio State, a lot left to be desired on defense. Same goes for Florida uh, as they survive in Nashville in a game that was much closer than I think the score really indicates. If Florida played like that against any other team, they play like that last week against Arkansas, they play that week uh, like that against Georgia, uh, they lose. I would think they would lose. Really, I do. Vanderbilt just did not have the horses. They didn't have the talent uh, and the speed and experience uh, to hang in that game the way other teams could have. Moving over to the Sun Belt Conference. We don't talk Sun Belt that often, but when you've got a team like Coastal Carolina, you kind of have to. The 15th ranked Chanticleers just became the first Sun Belt Conference team to start 8 0 in 20 years. 20 seasons it has taken a Sun Belt team to start 8 0, and it's Jamie Chadwell and Coastal Carolina. They just beat Appalachian State 34 23. And this was one of those under the radar games that. Uh, We didn't talk about much going into this week, but we knew had the potential to be very exciting and huge for, you know, potential New Year's Six Bowl berths and uh, just just the Sunbelt Conference title race in general. This is two two of the top teams in the conference, and it proved to be a great matchup, as we would expect. Coastal Carolina trailed this game 23-21 with under three minutes remaining in the fourth quarter. But they got a touchdown from Reese White with 2.34 remaining. Retook the lead. And then icing on the cake, just to add on top of that for style points, Coastal Carolina ended the game with a 38-yard pick six. And that's why they won by 11. So that's game again. A lot closer than I think the score really indicated. But Sean DeClear is getting the job done at home, again behind the leadership and the arm of Grayson McCall. 200 passing yards and two touchdowns. Had a beautiful, beautiful 75-yard bomb in the first quarter. They also had a ridiculous 62-yard touchdown run as well. McCall was, I believe, the leading rusher for the Chanticleers when it was all said and done. So this Coastal Carolina squad, they're legit. They are Sun Belt Conference title contenders. They are going to make the Sun Belt Conference championship game. They will play Louisiana. They'll get to host Louisiana. And keep in mind, they beat the Raging Cajuns on the road earlier this year. So you're looking at a potential undefeated, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but a Coastal Carolina team that could finish undefeated and win the Sun Belt and unfortunately for them, they're not going to be able to make a New Year's Six Bowl game unless someone like BYU or Cincinnati starts to slip up. And I don't see that being very likely. But regardless, unbelievable season for Coastal Carolina. Whatever happens over the next few weeks, one of the best, probably the best in school history. Speaking of group of five teams, how about another one? American Athletic Conference, Cincinnati, Central Florida. This was not a top 25 matchup, but like we said in our Week 12 predictions, we said This had the feel of a top 25 matchup. 
because we knew UCF was a top 25 caliber team. Cincinnati, they're seventh in the country. They're the front runners to win the American Athletic, and they're hoping to get into the college football playoff. And to do that, they needed to win out. they got to win every game, and they've got to win convincingly. And I would say that even though they only beat Central Florida 36-33, to I would say they won convincingly in this one. Some may disagree. The Bearcats trailed 14-3 to at the end of the first quarter. Everybody thought there was an upset brewing. Finally, Central Florida's offense, finally a offense, was going to exploit Cincinnati's very stingy defense. And Cincinnati said, no, no, no. We were, we were sleepwalking through that first quarter. Now we're awake. Because after trailing 14-3, to the Bearcats scored 16 unanswered. From that point on, they outscored Central Florida 33-19 to over the remainder of the game to win by three. And how are they doing this? Not just behind their defense. Their defense holding UCF to just 359 yards. It's like almost 300 yards, about 250 yards less than their season average. Unbelievable in and of itself. So their defense is the strength, but they're also doing it behind Desmond Ritter. Early in the year, inconsistent. 2019, inconsistent. Now, over the past five, six games, unreal. Desmond Ritter, 338 yards and two touchdowns. Also added 57 rushing yards and two more touchdowns. He's the leader of the Cincinnati team. And for Cincinnati to make the playoff to win the conference, they have to rely on Ritter, and he has to continue to play at this rate. He did it this week. He did it against Memphis, Houston, SMU, East Carolina. You name the opponent, he's doing it. And that is going to be the make-or-break reason of whether or not Cincinnati gets into the playoff, or maybe they don't. But a big win in the bounce house That's not an easy place to play. And that's something the committee is going to take into account when they release their first set of rankings on Tuesday is they are winning these games. And again, I know it's only by three points, but they're winning these games convincingly. To come back down 11 uh, and battle back and and really after that point hold control of the game uh, for the remainder of the game, for the remaining 45 minutes or so, that's impressive. And again, they have wins over Army now, SMU, Memphis, Central Florida, potentially... And a top 25 win over Tulsa if the Golden Hurricane continue to play well uh, and they are a ranked team in the season finale. So Cincinnati's playoff berth and hopes are not dashed. They are very much alive. And this win over UCF helped them out a lot because, again, they're not a top 25 team, but the committee knows that they are a top 25 caliber team. They are a top 25 caliber team. And if you can shut down that offense like Cincinnati just did, uh, I believe they can shut down plenty of other top offenses out there as well. So unbelievable job by Luke Fickle and the Bearcats. The group of five playoff hopes, the Bearcats playoff hopes, still alive and well. And they're just going to be, uh, you know, right there on the fence. They're going to be making or made or broken every single week because we, also, we all know one loss will ruin them. Moving over to the Big Ten, we have a ranked versus ranked matchup now. And this was a fun one. This was a very, very fun one if you like defense. Number 19, Northwestern. They just took down number 10, Wisconsin. How about that? The Wildcats just got their first win against a top 10 opponent since 2011. They just got their first home win against a top 10 opponent since 2004. And you know, coming into this game, we knew it would be low scoring. We knew it would be a low scoring, defensive slugfest, one in the trenches. Uh, But we picked Wisconsin. We picked Wisconsin. Obviously, we we missed that game. We missed that pick. Uh, Because we said and we thought and we believed that Graham Mertz, the quarterback for the Badgers, would be the difference maker. We believed he would be the difference maker. And, in a way, he was. Because Mertz, who had played so well in his first two collegiate starts against Illinois and Michigan, uh, came into this game against Northwestern, threw for 230 yards, but three interceptions. Through three interceptions to the Wildcats. Wisconsin, as a whole, had five turnovers against the Wildcats in a defensive game. If you win the turnover battle and you give your offense a short field like Northwestern was able to do multiple times, you're going to win the game. And that's exactly what Pat Fitzgerald's squad did. Wisconsin, they just didn't know what to do. They looked lost. They looked lost on offense. Mertz was constantly under pressure. He looked uncomfortable in the pocket. He was missing wide open throws. He was turning the ball over left and right. Wisconsin did not seem like they had a plan in place offensively and never to me felt like they made adjustments to try to exploit this Northwestern defense. Never really felt that way. So it was, I believe, 7-7 early in the game, and then after that it was all Northwestern offensively 
and defensively. Even though Wisconsin outgained Northwestern by 103 yards, even though they held the Wildcats to 24 yards, it didn't matter because the short fields benefited the Wildcats and Peyton Ramsey outdid and outplayed Graham Mertz. Peyton Ramsey, the Indiana transfer, coming over to Northwestern, who was one of the worst offensive teams in the country last year. Ramsey throws for 203 yards and two touchdowns. He wasn't flashy, wasn't electric, but he was efficient, and he did just enough. The Wildcats are undefeated. They will be, when the committee releases their rankings, will be, should be, a top 15 team. Very well could be higher because this was a convincing win over Wisconsin. And their remaining schedules at Michigan State, at Minnesota, Illinois, there's a very good chance they can win out. They're front runners in the West, and there's a very good chance they will meet Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game, much like we saw a few years ago. Two years ago, it was that we saw those two meet in the Big Ten title game. Northwestern kind of felt like a fluke at the time. It was weird to see them in there. doesn't feel like a fluke this year. And that defense, that defense could very well slow down Justin Fields and Ohio State offense, no doubt in my mind. So the Wildcats, Northwestern Wildcats, one of the more surprise teams, biggest surprise teams in the country this year. Here they are, undefeated, front runners in the West. Guarantee that uh, we all thought that was going to happen. Over in the Pac-12, real quick, Chip Kelly makes his return to Eugene. Number 11, Oregon, UCLA. The Ducks survived again. Say it like that. They beat Stanford convincingly. They had to come back uh, from behind to beat Washington State last week uh, and then barely survived UCLA in this game, beating the Bruins 38-35. Keep in mind, this was a UCLA team without their dual-threat quarterback, Dorian Thompson-Robinson. So... I would like to believe that if UCLA had him and they had that dangerous dual threat ability with him, Oregon may have lost this game. Now, again, everybody wants to say, you know, Oregon is the Pac-12's best chance of getting into the college football playoff. I I really don't think that if Oregon goes undefeated, they get in. I just don't think it's possible this year. But you would like to hope and you would like to see that happen. You'd at least like to have a chance. And to do that, the Ducks have to go undefeated. They almost lost that chance on Saturday. Oregon, to me, though... To, has proven to me against Stanford, against Washington State, against uh, UCLA, they're a second half team. They are a late first half, very late first half, and then all second half team. Because let's think about what happened last week against Washington State. They scored a touchdown with three seconds remaining in the first half and then dominated the second half, beat the Cougars by 14. Here against UCLA, they get a 58 yard pick six as time expires in the first half. That gives them a 24 to 21 lead. Gives them momentum going into halftime. And then after that, it was all Oregon, and they ended up winning by three. End up winning by three. They don't get that touchdown at the end of the first half. Who knows what happens? Who knows what happens? But again, good teams find a way to win, and that's exactly what the Doug, uh, the Ducks did. UCLA, they had one last drive in that game. So it was 38-35. They had a chance to go win or tie it. It stalled at the Oregon 41. To me, what this shows me is that Chip Kelly's squad is getting better. Not quite there yet, but they're getting better. This Oregon team, they're solid, but they have a lot left desired on the defensive side of the ball as well. They allowed 462 yards in this game to the Bruins, although they did have and force four turnovers. So Ohio State, Florida, Oregon, some of these top teams in the country, a lot left to be desired on the defensive side of the ball. The offense, though, no worries whatsoever for those teams, including Oregon. Tyler Shuck. 334 yards and three touchdowns. I'd say he's filling in the gap for Justin Herbert just fine. There were concerns about him taking over under center. I think he's doing just fine. I'm sure many of of you Duck fans would agree with that. But Oregon, remaining undefeated. The schedule's very favorable from here on out for them. Uh, Big game against uh, Oregon State, I believe, on Friday. Coming up in Oregon State, no pushover anymore. Got to get past them. But there's a very good chance Oregon will finish undefeated, go to the Pac-12 championship game, and We'll see what happens from there. But they survived the Bruins, an emotional game for both sides, and Chip Kelly falling just short against his former team. Over in the Big 12 again, Iowa State. How about that? The Cyclones making a statement, not just to the Big 12, but to the country. This team's legit. We're for real, and we might be the best team in the Big 12 right now. Some might say Oklahoma. I'm going to say Iowa State. Cyclones just beat Kansas State 45 to nothing. 45 to nothing. T 
10 of the last 12 games prior to this one between Iowa State and Kansas State, 10 of the last 12 were decided by one possession. Last year was an exception. Kansas State beat the Cyclones by 10. And now this year is a major exception. I did not see this coming. I, I felt very, very confident that Iowa State would win this game. Really, there was no doubt in my mind that Iowa State would win this game. But by 45, a shutout? No, not even close. This was by far the best performance we've seen from Iowa State this season. No doubt about it. This was the best, most complete game that Iowa State has put together in 2020. Brees Hall, one of the best running backs in the country. If you don't know his name, you need to know it. He deserves more recognition. He has now reached his eighth straight game with at least 100 rushing yards. Had 135 yards against uh, the Wildcats. Had two touchdowns to go along with that. Brock Purdy. He's been inconsistent all year long. Saved one of his best performances for one of the biggest games of the year for Iowa State. 16 for 20, only four incompletions, 236 yards, and three touchdowns. The defense, you can't get any better than a shutout. And I get, you know, people want to say, you know, Will Howard, uh, you know, didn't play most of the game. Uh, Kansas State's offense has been sputtering, period. Uh, Blame Skylar Thompson not being there because he's been hurt for a few weeks. Whatever you want to say, I don't like excuses like that. I don't really like excuses like that because they've had weeks to prepare and they've had weeks without Skylar Thompson and weeks without, uh, you know, not many starters on the offensive side of the ball. We knew Kansas State would struggle offensively. There's no excuse for that. And even if they had some of those key players back, not going to make up 45 points. So Iowa State, this team is for real. Had 539 yards in this game. Kansas State had 149 Iowa State forced three turnovers. The Cyclones had none of their own. Iowa State had the big game coming up against Texas. After Texas, they have West Virginia. If they beat Texas, lock for the Big 12 title game. No doubt about it. Even if they lose, they've got a very good chance of getting in, in my opinion. You look at Iowa State, I think they're the front runners to win the Big 12 right now. A lot of people didn't think it was going to happen. A lot of people didn't think it was their year, especially if they lost to Louisiana in their first game of the year. But they're on a roll, and they've been on a roll since then. Without that regards, uh, disregard that little hiccup against Oklahoma State. That's their only conference loss. You don't have that, they're playoff contenders. But nonetheless, they have their eyes set on a Big 12 title, and I think there's a very good chance they get it this year. Unbelievable performance from the Cyclones and Ames. Three games left, sticking in the Big 12. How about a bedlam blowout? Number 18, Oklahoma, takes down their rival, Oklahoma State, the 14th ranked team in the country, 41-13. to this game was over within the first 10 minutes. Really about the first nine minutes. Oklahoma State jumped out to a 21 to nothing lead. Three possessions, three touchdowns. Done. Cowboys were toast. And look, we talked about this in our in our recap in our video for this game. Our game of the week analysis video between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. We said, what's gonna give? Will Oklahoma State best defense in the Big 12? We we didn't know if it was still gonna be considered that. Would they be able to shut down Spencer Rattler and an Oklahoma team that was averaging over 500 yards per game? Uh, or would Oklahoma struggle a little bit? Uh, would Oklahoma struggle a little bit? Or, or would they exploit Oklahoma State's defense? What was going to give in this game? And I think we got that answer again within the first 10 minutes that it was going to be all Oklahoma from start to finish. Spencer Rattler, he played out of his mind. 301 yards, four touchdowns. He has been playing great ever since that Texas game. Start with Texas. Come to now, five straight wins for Oklahoma. A ba major reason for that is the play of Spencer Rattler. He struggled early in the year. Keep in mind, he's just a freshman. It was bound to happen. As the season progressed, he has gotten better and better. And Oklahoma is one of the hottest teams in the country. And personally, would love to see a rematch between Iowa State and Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game. But they took down the Cowboys in this game. They had four sacks. They had seven tackles for a loss. They held Chuba Hubbard and L.D. Brown. All the Oklahoma State rushing team combined to 78 yards, 78 rushing yards. Again, the Cowboys were just no match. They didn't seem prepared. They seemed scared. You go back and look at the first offensive drive for Oklahoma State. You get a quick intentional grounding call. Get a false start. So it was like second and 26, just like that, on their first offensive drive. I mean, the crowd was loud. It seemed like Oklahoma State was intimidated. They were scared. Uh, they've never fared well, really, against Oklahoma. They were 4-16 against the Sooners since 2000, bumping up to 4-17 now. That loss, 
damages Oklahoma State's uh, damages Oklahoma State's title hopes, Big 12 title hopes, big time. Right now, I think your two front runners are Iowa State and Oklahoma. What happens this upcoming week will be very, very huge and very, very telling. But the Sooners, Lincoln Riley, unbelievable job. One and two start. They're now six and two. They've won five straight games. They close with West Virginia on the road and Baylor at home. Both of those look like wins to me. They do that. They're playing for another Big 12 title. Again, something we didn't think was going to happen just a few weeks ago. Two more games. ACC. A top 25 team goes down. We had three ranked versus ranked matchups. So we knew three ranked teams were going to lose. But there was one other team in the top 25 that went down that fell to an unranked opponent. It's number 21 Liberty in North Carolina State. The Wolfpack pulled off the upset. Even though they were favored, they pulled off the upset after Liberty's field goal was blocked. And I think it's very funny. It kind of comes full circle. If you remember, Liberty beat Virginia Tech on a game-winning field goal as time expired. The field goal was blocked originally, returned for a touchdown by Virginia Tech, but it turns out that the Hokies had iced Liberty. So that touchdown off the blocked field goal was negated. It didn't count. Now you come to this game against another ACC opponent. Liberty lines up for a game-winning field goal. It's blocked, and this time it does count. So maybe Liberty should have had a loss a few weeks ago, but they stayed alive. And at sitting at 8-0, and they had their first loss of the season handed to them by the NC State Wolfpack, who are really, I think, exceeding expectations in 2020. A low-scoring game, 15-14 to in favor of NC State. Their defense doing a fantastic job, forcing three interceptions off of Malik Willis. I mean, again, you win the turnover battle in a game like that, you force those short fields in a low-scoring game like that, very similar to Wisconsin-Northwestern, you're going to win the game. So the Wolfpack, doing what many thought wasn't possible, even though they were still favored, doing what many th- think was not possible. Liberty, the magic ride, the flame, it's been extinguished, but just for a second. Again, like Coastal Carolina, this is, has to be one of the best, if not the best season in program history for the Flames. They'll do- drop out of the top 25. They should drop out of the top 25, but there's maybe a slight chance they'll wiggle themselves back in there to set up a top 25 showdown against Coastal Carolina on December 5th. Even if it's a top 15 Coastal team versus an unranked Liberty team, it's going to be must-see football between these two great offenses, two of the better stories in college football this year. But Liberty, Hugh Freeze taking their first loss of the year into North Carolina State, of all people. And then finally, our last game. It wasn't the biggest game. It wasn't the big marquee game. It wasn't a rank versus rank game. But my God, it was exciting. Michigan and Rutgers. How about that? You know, a couple of years ago, it was Michigan that beat the Scarlet Knights. Was it 78 to nothing? 78 to nothing. And it's just crazy how much has changed since then. How much a few years can do. And how much one coach can do for a team. Because while Rutgers lost this game to Michigan 48-42 to in not one, not two, but three overtimes, Scarlet Knights played their hearts out and should have won this game. They were up 17 to nothing late in the second quarter, but they trailed 35-27 to late in the fourth. And then after that, everybody thought this was just typical Rutgers. They're going to blow this big lead. They're going to lose the game. But this is a great Shiano-led Rutgers team. This isn't Chris Ash anymore. There's no quit there's no quit in this Rutgers team. We saw that against Ohio State. We see that again here now. And you look at this. Noah Vedral hooks up with Aaron Cookshank, the transfer wide receiver from Wisconsin. He scores. Makes it 35-33. And Vedral rushes in for the two-point conversion. We're going to overtime. Both teams miss a field goal in overtime. Michigan missed it first. So Rutgers had a chance to pull off the monumental victory. Missed the field goal. We go to a second overtime. Rutgers scores like that. Beautiful screen pass, a little bit of a mixed misdirection. Federal rolls right, turns around, throws left, wide open, touchdown. Rutgers, Piscataway, they're going crazy. Michigan answers. Go to the third overtime. Michigan scores. Doesn't get the two-point conversion. It's 48-42, a touchdown, a two-point conversion, wins it for Rutgers. Face the fourth and nine, we're unable to convert. Michigan escaped. To improve to two and three. Improve to two and three. Look, Harbaugh's on the hot seat. Harbaugh's going to be gone. Lo- falling, winning, I should say, by just six points at Rutgers is nothing to be necessarily proud of for a Wolverines team that, in theory, has more talent, more depth, more speed uh, than a Scarlet Knights program that's been struggling for so long and is dealing with a brand new head coach in Greg Schiano. 
But while the Rutgers Scarlet Knights are one in four, and while this loss was devastating, if you are a Rutgers fan, you have to be pleased with the effort that you saw on Saturday. It was one of the most exciting games of Week 12. A lot of people had their eyes on this game because it was Rutgers and Michigan. Again, I kept thinking back, 78 to nothing, and now this team has taken Michigan to triple overtime. I get this is not the Michigan team that we saw many years ago. This is a bad Michigan team all the way around. But still, how far Rutgers has come in such a short amount of time and just a few games under Greg Schiano is extremely, extremely impressive. They're just not able to get over the hump. Couldn't do it against Indiana, couldn't do it here, couldn't do it against Illinois, but they're getting there. The competitive drive is there. And in a few years, Shiano's going to have this team back to national and Big Ten relevancy. You can have my word on that. So an unbelievable weekend of college football, guys. I'm telling you, it was awesome. I mean, really. And there were games that we didn't even touch on. JT Daniels makes his debut for Georgia, leads the Bulldogs to a seven-point victory over Mississippi State. Georgia finally finds himself a quarterback, though. Game was a lot closer than it should have been, 31-24. But they finally have a quarterback in JT Daniels. Arkansas LSU, a thriller. Minnesota Purdue, a thriller. And we'll touch on those here in a second when we talk about our teams trending up and trending down. Let's start with the good news, I guess. We'll start with good news. And we'll start with Illinois, a team we just mentioned a second ago who beat Rutgers a few weeks ago. Finding a line are 0-3, or were 0-3, but now they're two and three. They've won two straight games. I know what you're thinking. Why are two wins, you know, why does that justify putting a team on trending up? Well, Illinois was supposed to be one of the more, uh, I guess, surprise teams and experienced teams in the Big Ten this year. After the very disappointing start, uh, to see them at two and three now, to see them playing the way we thought they would play is encouraging. So they deserve to be on the, te- on the team's trending up board. They are coming off a 41-23 win at Nebraska, a performance where I did I thought we saw the team we expected them to be. Brandon Peters played well, but finally back uh, after missing a few weeks. The defense played extremely well, forced five turnovers. They had 285 rushing yards. This Illinois team looked good. And I get it's just Nebraska. Nothing to, nothing to brag about. It's like Michigan shouldn't brag about beating Rutgers. But this Illinois team looked good, and we saw flashes of brilliance here and there from a team where we expected a lot more out of this year, but a team that can still salvage their season uh, over the next few weeks. Iowa, another team out of the Big Ten trending up. Like Illinois, they were winless for a while. They've strung together a few wins. They were 0-2, now they're 3-2. and And they're winning their games in dominating fashion. That's why they're trending up for me. The quality of opponents, not great, but it's the way Iowa's taking care of business. 42-point win against Michigan State. 28-point victory against Minnesota, 20-point victory in Happy Valley against Penn State, a Penn State team that is now 0-5. We had them trending down, but we already had them trending down last week. What are you going to do? So <laughs> they beat Penn State and Happy Valley by 20. Iowa finally turning things around, and they have a very good chance to win out as well. Nebraska at home, at Illinois, Wisconsin at home, and we now know the Badgers are vulnerable. So they're hitting their stride. Their defense is playing well. Spencer Petrus is playing well. Iowa and Kirk Ferris playing like a team, like the team we thought they would be coming into 2020. And then finally, Nevada, 5-0 for the first time in 10 years. 5-0 for the first time in 10 years. They just beat San Diego State by 5 points on national TV. Nevada and San Diego State, that was your 230 CBS game. So a great opportunity for both those Mountain West programs. But the Wolfpack, they're 5-0. The Mountain West not doing divisions this year. They're 5-0, and and they join San Jose State and Boise State as the lone unbeaten teams in the Mountain West. As the lone unbeaten teams in the Mountain West. So, that means they have a very good chance to make the Mountain West Championship game. They might slip up down the road. They have to face San Jose State in the season finale. If they get past them, they might have to play Boise. Maybe they lose. But what Jay Norvell is doing with the Wolfpack is unbelievable, really. A, a program that was struggling for much of the uh, early or middle, I was middle to late 2010s, uh, has finally turned a corner to a point where they're kind of becoming a consistent bowl team and now could be in store for one of the better years in program history. Teams turning down. California, they're 0-2. This is a team that was supposed to be good this year. Very, very experienced. I thought maybe they could challenge Oregon for that North Division crown. Not anymore. Not anymore. They lost by 24 to UCLA. They just lost by four, 31 to 27 to Oregon State. 
They're 0-2. No chance they can overtake Oregon. Even if somehow they pull off a win against the Ducks, they'd own that tiebreaker, but they'd have two losses. The Ducks would have one. It's just not happening. And I really question what went wrong for Chase Garbers and Justin Wilcox uh, out in California. I'm very disappointed uh, with, with the Golden Bears. Kansas State, another team I'm disappointed with. They were number 16 in the country just a few weeks ago. When they reached that 16th spot, they lost by 27 to West Virginia. Lost by 27 to West Virginia. Then they lost by to Oklahoma State, a game where they led 12 to nothing and lost 20 to 18. And now they just lost 45 to nothing to Iowa State, as we mentioned. Kansas State, they're struggling. I get they've been hit with COVID. I get they've been hit with injuries. Uh, but to start as well as they did, with the exception of that Arkansas State loss, and now to have lost, what now, three straight games and sitting at four and four, uh, that's very frustrating and disappointing for Chris Kleiman and his squad out in Manhattan. But I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, as I'm going to give multiple coaches and teams the benefit of the doubt. This is a wild year for college football. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about injuries. Nothing you can do about COVID cases. Everybody's trying to make the best with what they have. Uh, and next year will hopefully be better for a lot of these teams, including Chris Kleiman out in Manhattan. And then our final guy we have trending down are the officials. Not a team. I guess you could call them a team of officials. Officiating in college football this year has been horrendous. It has been pitiful. It has been disgraceful. It has been embarrassing for the individual conferences and for college football as a whole. There are so many examples. Purdue and Minnesota. Purdue called for offensive pass interference on their game-winning touchdown. Go watch the replay. Not even close. Where was it? There was no pass interference there whatsoever. Maybe a slight extension of the arm, maybe. But Purdue, that game-winning touchdown was taken away. The very next play, they throw an interception. Minnesota wins. Horrible. Embarrassing. Not one person should decide the game like that. A person that's not out there on the field actually physically playing the game, they shouldn't have a say in who wins the game, like the officials did to the Boilermakers. How about Arkansas LSU? Tons of controversial calls uh, in that game on both sides. So a lot, mo most of them benefited LSU, but some benefited Arkansas as well. The phantom tripping call on Arkansas's final drive of the game. How about that? How about the fumble recovery by Arkansas? Where the referees said there was no clear recovery by the Razorbacks, yet there clearly was. And while the Razorbacks got a fumble later in that drive, field position meant everything in that game. So very questionable calls there. Uh, pass interference calls in that game. Pass interference calls in Northwestern Wisconsin. There are a couple very questionable ones there. Same with Tennessee-Auburn. I mean, it doesn't matter what game it is. There are questionable calls no matter what game you want. And sometimes not one call is going to decide the game. Sometimes it does, but not always. It's easy for us fans to say, well, we lost because of the referee. Sometimes you do. Most of the times you don't. But what people don't understand is that while some play calls and some penalties might not make or break a game, one pass interference call might not make or break a game, it can totally shift momentum. It can totally keep a drive alive. It can affect field position for certain teams. And that, at the end of the day, can affect the outcome of a game. The officiating in college football this year has been horrible, so much so we might make an entire video about it. But the SEC, in particular, has been horrible. And the unfortunate thing for all of these teams, regardless of what conference they're in, is if they get you know, just totally screwed by the officiating crew, the conference will come out that following Monday and say, oh, we're sorry, we made a mistake. It's a little slap on the wrist. Oh, no, we messed up. And they're not going to give you that win. They're not going to fire the officiating crew. They're not going to punish the officiating crew. They get off scot-free. These guys have got to be made accountable. Got to find a way to make our officials accountable. Got to find a way to make the games better uh, and less controversial because we've seen a lot of it in college football this year. And it's super, super unfortunate for all of these teams that have been affected. So a little brand about the officials there. We might talk more about it later on. We'll find out. Who knows? But they deserve to be trending down. And they probably will be trending down for the remainder of the year. Regardless, though, guys, week 12 of college football, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Not many major upsets. I uh, saw a handful, but uh, enough that we're going to see some shakeups in the rankings. The College Football Playoff Committee releases their first set of rankings on Tuesday. We're going to be breaking that down for you. We're also going to be putting out our own set of rankings on Monday. Not the AP poll. The GE Top 25 coming your way on Monday. And trust me, it's going to look nothing like the AP poll, nothing like the committee's poll. We're going to get it right. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Week 13 predictions coming your way. It's Thanksgiving week. We've got football all week long. You can't beat it. College football still in full force. We're nearing the end 
Uh, but unfortunately, while we near the end, that, that does not fun for us, but it also provides some of the best and most exciting football of the year. So stay tuned. We're going to have you covered. You're not going to want to miss any of it. So guys, again, thank you so much for watching us here at The Grid Iron Expert on YouTube. Make sure to continue to like, comment, subscribe, share our videos. Check out everything down in that description below. Just like we mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you love college football, this is the place for you. And everything down there is specifically for you. So make sure to go check it out. And once again, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you next time right here on The Grid Iron Expert. Oh,